I'm Adam. And I'm Cupcake. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Hey, Cupcake, are you familiar with Judith Scott? Isn't she an R&B singer? Not quite. She was a deaf mute artist born with Down syndrome that has had her pieces exhibited all around the world, including New York, San Francisco, France, and Switzerland. Holy cow, that is impressive. Also impressive, a cow yelling holy cow. In today's book, we learn all about the life and art of Judith Scott. Let's get started. Unbound, The Life and Art of Judith Scott by Joyce Scott with Bree Spangler and Melissa Sweet. Art by Melissa Sweet. Entwined. Before we know the touch of air on our skin, my sister and I know each other. Judy and I are twins. We are each other's world. We share everything. Our mom, our dad, our three older brothers, and our home. Together, under the sun, the moon, and the stars, it's all we know. We are happy. We sleep like spoons nestled in a drawer. We play inside with twin dolls and a pair of tiny teacups. Outside, we have matching pails for making mud pies and mulberry soup. I don't know if everything comes in twos, but it seems that way to me. Most days, neighborhood kids come and go. We circle around each other's backyards until our parents call us in for supper. No matter where we are, Judy wants to do what I'm doing. Mommy says we're two peas in a pod. On warm nights, we play on an old outdoor couch with our upside down selves lying close together like tiny explorers of the universe. Between the blue sea below and the million stars above to guide us, Judy's eyes are wide and she squeezes my arm with both her hands. Soon I begin kindergarten. Mom tries to enroll Judy in school, but she has special needs that keep her home. Judy has what will come to be known as Down syndrome. She was born with an extra chromosome buried deep inside. The doctor said she would have learning disabilities and that her heart was not as strong as it should be. Judy has never spoken a word. We wonder if she will ever talk. The doctors say that she is slow and will not get better, but they don't know Judy like I do. She's perfect just the way she is. She knows things that no one else knows and sees the world in ways that I never will. The colors have gone. One day, I wake up and reach for my sister, but she's gone. I look for her everywhere. Daddy is gone too. I find mommy in the kitchen sitting alone. She tells me Judy's gone away. Daddy took her to a special school where she'll live now. The teachers there will help her learn to talk. That night, Daddy returns. I hide in the hall and listen as he tells mommy how hard it was to leave Judy. I know how sad Judy must have been because now I feel sad too. And just like that, my whole world disappears and is replaced with the colors of gone. Every set of twins that I've ever known were best good friends with each other. Me too. It doesn't seem to be any different with these girls, even though they can't talk to each other. Some say that twins have a special form of communication. I wonder which twin it was harder for being separated. It's impossible to tell. You can't gauge such things. It makes me want to call my sister. Do you have a twin? Do cows have a bunch of siblings born at one time? No, we're just like humans, usually one at a time. It's not like we're Tenrex. What is a Tenrex? I thought you were some kind of Mr. Smotty Pants. A Tenrex is an African mammal that looks a lot like a hedgehog or a shrew. What does that have to do with twins? They can have up to 30 babies at once. That's the most of any mammal. I feel like we've gotten off track. Let's get back to Judy Scott. Our room stays the same. Judy's magazine, doll, plastic zoo animals. The wooden blocks are scattered everywhere. Mommy puts Judy toys in a box, but I don't let her take them away. Every night, I pile the toys beside me on the bed and feel each one in the dark, thinking about Judy's hands holding them. Finally, my parents take me to visit my sister. I wear my yellow dress just like Judy's and hope she'll wear hers too, so everyone will know we're twins. 
I pack her a magazine with pictures of bunnies that I know she will love. But when we arrive, I don't understand this place can't be a school. There's no playground, no desks or books, no chalkboards, crayons, or colored paper. Judy and I hug each other tight, and she sits right on the floor, pulling me down with her. She wants to look at the magazine. I find the bunny page for her, and she likes it a lot. I knew she would. I clutch Judy close and say hi in a loud voice. I'm desperate for her to learn to speak. Judy replies, ho, ho, ba, and pats my face. From that day on, in my mind, even though we are apart, Judy doesn't stay inside the horrible gray place. She stays outside with me, breathing in the colors of our world, unbound. The years turn, and each time I visit my sister, I can't bear to say goodbye. I bring friends to meet Judy. Later, my husband meets her, and then my children. But as time goes on, I'm now living so far away that distance keeps us apart, yet I still dream of her by my side. I decide it's time. I call Judy's institution in Ohio to tell them I want her to come live with me in California. I need to know everything about her so I can be ready for our life together. I press the phone hard to my ear. A woman tells me how difficult it is to care for my twin, especially because she's deaf. What does she mean deaf? She tells me that Judy may have been deaf most of her life. How could she be deaf if we didn't know? Is this why she w has never talked? Then I remember moments from our childhood. Judy running down the street with all of us shouting at her while she keeps going. Judy! 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 Joyce and Judy! Judy! She needed my touch to stop when my parents called us inside. Judy's records arrive before she does. They read, not appropriate for any educational program. Behavioral problems. Unmanageable. How dare they label my sister and deny her the right to learn. They don't know Judy like I do. Finally, the day comes. The institution promises me that someone will accompany Judy on her first ever flight. But waiting at the airport with my family, I see the last person off the plane is a lone figure, small and stooped, in the distance. I rush toward her. My sister drops her purse and magazines and melts into my arms. My daughter slips in between us, and she too holds Judy while my husband wraps his arms around the bundle that is us. It's as if we were never apart. So you're telling me that nobody knew that she was deaf for what, 30 years? How does that one slip past you? There's a lot of contributing factors. Judith was mute, so she never talked anyway. Plus, she had a very difficult time understanding things. I had a dog that was deaf, and he never talked. Don't get upset with me. It wasn't me. I'm sure her family felt terrible when they realized that Judith was deaf and hadn't done anything to help her in such a large part of her life. Good thing they helped her escape from that place, too. You need to stop giving these people a hard time. They were doing the best that they could for her. I'll give you a hard time. A new language. Judy is happy. We are all happy. But I know that she needs a place to learn, to be with people, especially while I'm away from home each day working as a nurse. I hear about a local art studio, Creative Growth Art Center, that offers programs for adults with disabilities. The artists are encouraged to express themselves using whatever materials they choose. I have no idea if Judy will like being here. I'm not aware of her making anything ever, not even a drawing. At Creative Growth, the walls are bursting with creativity. The teachers offer Judy the chance to work with clay and colored pencils, to try painting and working with wood. Many months go by, but nothing interests her. Judy only wants to look at her magazines. I worry that she may not be allowed to stay if she isn't making art. Then one day, Judy watches the teacher spread out all sorts of natural material. The teacher encourages Judy to join in. Judy picks delicate willow twigs and winds them together with yarn and twine, weaving in odd bits of wood. She secures the bundle with nails and colorful pins, then paints it. And just like that, a form emerges. Her teachers are encouraged. We're all encouraged. Judy has made something as unique as she is. 
The next day, she makes another form, and then another. From that moment on, every morning, Judy bursts into creative growth and goes directly to her place in the studio, sets her magazines on a chair, and begins working. Judy chooses colorful yarns and fibers, chunks of woods, and a shopping cart for her art. Sometimes, as she forges the studio for materials, Judy borrows a tool, someone's keys or eyeglasses, and weave these objects deep into her work. When a piece is complete, my sister gives a thumbs up, pass it, pushes away, and begins another. For years, Judy wraps and weaves, creating fantastic cocoon-like shapes filled with color. She wraps her head in beautiful hats, scarves, and ribbons, becoming her own work of art. Then one day, she makes a new piece, unlike any other, small and black, all the colors gone. Judy hands me her stack of beloved magazines. The next day, Judy dies in my arms. Though my sister died of heart failure, she lived much longer than anyone expected or could have hoped for. When she leaves this world, my sister is celebrated as a great artist. Her fame still grows. My twin and I shared a love as deep and wide as the starry night. We are two hearts forever entwined. That's amazing that she found a passion for something so late in life. Just like you in these read aloud videos. Yeah, I guess you're right. I was 40 years old when I started making them. It's amazing what can happen when you expose people to the arts. It's a shame that we never knew what she was thinking about while creating these pieces. Why do you think that the book is called Unbound? I think it has several reasons why. Judith's art is wrapped up and bound together. The two girls are bound together emotionally as twins. Judy was bound to her institution. Then, through her art, she found boundless opportunities. Great dad jokes, too. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm Adam, and I'm Cupcake, and this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Tying Loose Ends After being confined to an institution for 35 years, Judy began a new life in California where she attended the Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland for the final 18 years of her life. Here she worked five days a week creating more than 160 sculptures. As interest, even amazement in Judy's sculptures swelled, Creative Growth arranged several shows of her work. Judy soon became an internationally recognized fiber artist. Her work has been shown in museums around the world, including in New York, London, Paris, Dublin, Tokyo, and Lausanne, Switzerland. Other artists at Creative Growth have achieved similar recognition and fame. Creative Growth is the first art studio of its kind for people with disabilities to explore, develop, and communicate their own creativity. The center is described as a model for creative community guided by the principle that art is fundamental to human expression and that all people are entitled to its tool of communication. They have inspired similar art centers all over the world. Most important, the artists there are recognized not for their limitations, but for their vast potential. Judy's life and legacy embody that truth. Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a genetic disorder caused by being born with an extra chromosome. Chromosomes contain the genes that carry all the information necessary for our bodies to develop and maintain themselves. Often children with Down syndrome take a longer time learning to speak. Some will have heart problems, hearing issues, and physical delays. But with education and support, most people with Down syndrome today will live happy and productive lives. The life expectancy for people born with Down syndrome is also much longer today than when Judith Scott was born. Despite the grim statistics, Judy outlived her life expectancy by 50 years. Timeline 1943, Joyce and Judith Scott are born on May 1st in Cincinnati, Ohio. 1948, Joyce begins kindergarten. 1950, Judith's parents place her in the Columbus State Institution on the advice of her doctor. 1969, Joyce moves to California where she works as a teacher and later a nurse. 1973, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is passed, giving people with disabilities equal access to programs, services, activities, and 
facilities that receive federal financial assistance. 1974, Creative Growth Art Center is founded by Florence Luden Cans and Elias Katz in Oakland, California. It is the oldest and largest nonprofit art studio for artists with developmental, intellectual, and physical disabilities. 1977, the Lanterman Act is passed, giving people with developmental disabilities the right to services and supports that enable them to live a more independent and normal life. 1985, Joyce begins the lengthy process of becoming Judith's legal guardian. 1985, Judith moves to California to be with Joyce and her family. 1987, Judith begins attending Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland. 1989, Sylvia Seventy, fiber artist and instructor in Creative Growth Art, enter facilities Judith's first piece of art using fiber materials and found objects. 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act is signed into law ensuring that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. 1999, the first show of Judith's work takes place coinciding with the publication of Metamorphosis, The Fiber Art of Judith Scott, written by John M. McGregor. 2003, a documentary film crew x-rays Judith's work to examine its construction and finds that objects are hidden inside. 2005, Judith dies on March 15th of heart failure. Did you know the Mona Lisa has her own mailbox in the Louvre because of all the love letters she receives.